zero seconds. And welcome to all the panelists and live viewers this evening. Micho kahe wash day. My name is Erin Genia, and I'm a Dakota person. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wakpin Oyate, and my pronouns are she, her. I currently reside on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people and within the territories of the Nipmuc and Wampanoag tribes. And um, I want to welcome everybody to the panel today and also let you know that we are experiencing a tropical storm here in Massachusetts and we may lose, some of us may lose power due to the high winds. And one of our speakers actually has already lost power. So um, we're trying to get her online. And if we cannot do that, uh, then we will um, make sure to include uh, Kristen um, in a recorded um, interview after the fact. So look out for that. Um, so, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just get started. Um, I'm an artist in residence for the city of Boston and uh, my work centers Dakota philosophies and amplifies the powerful presence of indigeneity on the occupied lands of what is today known as the United States of America. It hasn't always been known by that name. Um, and what I wanted to do for this panel um, is to talk a little bit about um, how this panel series, Confronting Colonial Myths in Boston's Public Space, came about. Um, it has stemmed from my work in my, my residency. Um, so within, within my residency, I work with the Department of Emergency Management, and um, there I have been considering how our culture is in a state of emergency. Um, and that we are confronting a cultural disaster without really actually understanding it for what it is, and really with no direction for addressing it. Um, and I think that this, this stems from our American cultural ideals, which are celebrated and cemented in the monuments and public art and memorials that we see all over the landscape of our city. Um, and these cultural, cultural ideals um, have created byproducts. And these byproducts um, have produced widespread emergencies and disasters for people all across the land. And we accept these byproducts of our culture as kind of like as collateral damage. Um, because for so many of us, we have to orient ourselves to, to this, these systems in order to survive. Um, but I guess I'm just, you know, as I'm doing this work, I'm wondering for how long can we continue or should we continue to go on accepting these harmful byproducts of American culture? And so some of the examples of uh, kind of the more large scale examples of what I've been considering uh, to be, you know, within this cultural emergency are climate change and environmental catastrophe due to resource extraction. Uh, mass extinction of species, institutionalized racism, white supremacy, and political polarization, global war and militarism, genocide, slavery, and incarceration, extreme wealth hoarding, and poverty, and this pandemic and other epidemics. These examples um, cause continual and imminent disasters threatening life and liberty for people. There's a strong cultural supremacy that is at the heart of American norms, which has so far prevented us from engaging in a society-wide process of critique. But we must come to terms with the fact that American culture is a result of Western European settler colonialism. That is its roots in the Roman Empire and the imperial philosophies that stem from those forces. In the same way, we must acknowledge that the city of Boston has been an epicenter of colonization for this continent and also bears responsibility for the cultural emergency we are in by perpetuating colonial myths. So it's a, it's a big question. How can we even start to address this state of cultural emergency? 
And as I think about it, um, I think that we must begin by identifying those harmful philosophies that are driving the systems, institutions, and behaviors of people in American society. Some of these that come to mind immediately are toxic individuality, the separation of the self from the natural world, hierarchical thinking and authoritarianism, binary thinking, short-term thinking, misogyny and toxic masculinity, violence as a tool, coercion through brute force and fear of dispossession, cultural supremacy, assimilation and cultural appropriation, historical amnesia, competition over cooperation, wastefulness and the squandering of energy, resources, and labor. So these, these are some of the ways um, of thinking and, and ha that have roots in American philosophy that cause harm um, at all levels of society. They lead to emergency situations over time, like the public health emergency of racism that the mayor has declared in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As I consider some of the monuments and art in public space in our city, for example, like the Columbus statue and the Founders Memorial and a lot of others, I actually see many of these same harmful philosophies reflected in them. And these monuments are actively upholding colonial myths and white supremacy that I believe is keeping us from truly progressing as a society. If we recognize and treated these problems as the cultural emergency that they are, we can use the models and protocols of emergency management and planning to dispatch funds, labor, and efforts across jurisdictions as a response. Why not? These provide well-resourced problem-solving approaches that are based upon collaboration. So for this residency, I'm developing and compiling some sort of creative methods for activating a cultural emergency response for the city of Boston to ask, can we avoid these threats by changing the ways we operate at cultural levels? And this stems from my uh, my own background as a Dakota person and centering my own Dakota philosophy that, uh, you know, coming from people who have been um, targeted for erasure by this dominant culture and whose culture is very different from American culture. Um, I'm, I'm in sort of in this position to, to be able to see this cultural emergency for what it is and that I think a lot of people are in a position to see this cultural emergency for what it is. Um, so one, one way to do this, uh, to begin this work, is to listen to the voices and perspectives of those who have been marginalized and who continue to be marginalized by the dominant culture. Uh, this platform is, this, this series is a platform uh, for indigenous artists and leaders and allies um, who, can speak about these connections between these colonial myths that we see in public space and the public health emergency of racism. So today uh, in this panel, we'll be hearing from two people whose tribes originate from the land in Boston and in, in the greater Boston region. And I will now turn to our speakers. Um, tonight we'll be hearing from Jenny Oliver, Jenny Oliver has been an artist in the city of Boston for 15 years, moving here after undergrad and working with the community as a teacher, performer, choreographer, and advocate for artistic integrity. As a culturally Black person of Cape Verdean and Indigenous heritage with membership in the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkapa, it has become important to her to address the erasure of Native people in her teachings and performances. In 2016, she established the Connections Dance Theater as a way to work at the intersection of dance, education, and philanthropy towards elevating issues affecting Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color. She was the inaugural recipient of the Dance Makers Residency at the Boston Center for the Arts 
where she debuted her first evening-length production, Hot Water Over Raised Fists, educating audiences about the injustice and urgency of water rights through the protests at Standing Rock and the ongoing crisis in Flint, Michigan. When she's not creating, she's elevating minds and empowering bodies on faculty at Tufts University, Emerson College, Deborah Mason Performing Arts Center, and at the Dance Complex. We'll also be hearing tonight from Kristen Wyman, and hopefully she will be able to connect um, uh, despite the storm that we're in. Kristen's fight for the right to land, food, medicine, and human dignity is completely tied to her identity and responsibility as a Nipmuc woman, mother, and daughter. She is co-founder of Eastern Woodlands Rematriation, a network of indigenous peoples restoring the foundation of sustainable food systems. Her work is deeply personal and motivated by the important roles of women as landholders, farmers, culture bearers, artisans, and diplomats. As the Global Movements Program Manager with Why Hunger, Kristen supports social movement processes at the global level in their path towards food sovereignty and liberation. She focuses mostly on strategic plans, communication strategies, and grassroots methodologies for building mass power. Thank you both for being with us this evening. Um, to, to the speakers, I would like to ask that you uh, state your preferred gender pronouns for the audience and the name of the tribal people upon whose land you are for our viewers and listeners. And for our audiences, if you have questions, um, please leave them in the comments and we can answer those after the live stream. And, and captions are available by clicking the captioning button in the video or in the comments. So beginning with Jenny, I would like to ask you to please tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us where you're from and share what you do. Hi and good evening. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coordinating this and inviting me to be able to be a part of it. It's really an honor. My name is Jenny Oliver. Um, I use the she pronouns, but whatever you feel works for you is also okay. Um, especially as I, I understand and know that as indigenous people, that's one of the things like right off the bat that, you know, these genders didn't really exist in the way that they uh, do now. And so I also understand that and give honor to that. Um, I'm joining you from the land of my ancestors, uh, the Massachusetts people. I'm very grateful to be here standing in all that I've been, all that I am and all that I will become for seven generations. Um, I wanna take a moment and give thanks to our clan leader that recently um, passed on, my, um, my great uncle, Eugene Oliver, he was um, the person that really kind of led and did a lot of the work that allows me to be able to be here um, for our family and for our tribe. And so I wanna uh, call in his spirit and honor him in that way. I also am grateful and wanna give thanks to our current clan leader, my uncle's uh, daughter, Jeannie, Jeannie Oliver Foster. Um, she I was hoping that she would be able to join us, but unfortunately she's not able to join us tonight. It'd be really an honor to be able to have her here. Um, Jeannie is really the educational matriarch um, as part of the work that she does. And I think that that's really important and valuable and um, really needs to be contributed to this conversation. And so I'm looking forward to, to being able to um, hear her eventually. Um, and then I want to say thank you to the tribe, the entire Massachusetts tribe, um, for Gil, to Gil Solomon, who has really laid down the foundation for our tribe and allowed us to even still be here in the way that we are. We are a small tribe, but a mighty tribe. Um, and, you know, living in the city of Boston um, with its very colonial, uh, settler colonial oppressive state that it is, it's really, um, can be a challenge and so I really appreciate and I'm grateful to Gil um, for all of the work that he does and continues to do for us. And I also wanna um, bring in the presence and acknowledge uh, Elizabeth Solomon who was on here last week as well. Um, I was able to tune in and I just feel honored to be able to be a part of this and kind of walk in the same shoes of those that have come before, that have passed on, those are currently here and those that will come um, in the future. So um, thank you for, coordinating this. Kristen, I'm so excited to be here with you. I can't believe that this is like happening. 
um, I really am uh, awestruck at all of the things that you do for the for yourself, for your family, for the community, for the tribes, for all of us as Indigenous people. It's really an honor for me to just be in your presence and same for Erin as well. Um, and I noticed that we're both wearing yellow, so that's nice. We didn't plan this, but um, I don't know if you see her yet on the live stream, but she's wearing yellow and I'm wearing yellow, so I think that there's some kind of kindred energy here uh, between us, so I'm grateful for that. Um, as you had mentioned, Aaron, thank you so much for reading um, a little bit about the work that I do. I'm going to actually do a screen share um, and talk a little bit about my passion, um, the things that really kind of get me going, and also show you a little clip of some work that I've created. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction that I created a show, show called Hot Water Over Racist, and that's really been um, kind of my pride and joy. I've worked on it for a few years. And, um, you know, I, I live at the intersection of my Black roots and my Indigenous roots, and I grew up in a working class um, household. And there was always uh, activism was a central part of the way that we were kind of exposed to our child, uh, exposed to, to ways of being in our childhood. So that part has always stuck with me. Um, and so I was involved in um, attending some rallies many years ago and really got fired up about what was happening not only in Flint but more importantly what was happening in uh, at Standing Rock um, and having people just come in and you know the, come in and try to put a pipeline through your ancestral lands and contaminating the water which we know that like we need water to survive we need clean natural water it just is too much to bear, I think, for me, um, especially living the reality that I that we are living here. I think as uh, Massachusetts people, um, you know, we literally are kind of like in the colonizer's den, and that to me, I don't want anyone else to um, experience that type of kind of change and disruption because I think that there's been a lot of disruption to our land. Um, so anyway, that was really kind of part of the. the the, part that, the parts that fired me up. And so created the show talking about those two different issues. Um, and it was also really striking to me to be able to do it at the Boston Center for the Arts because that institution sits on the land of the Massachusetts people. And so here it is that I get to um, go into a space and bring my ancestors' energy into there and kind of have a reclamation. I'm reclaiming and taking ownership of the space of my ancestors and that we have a right to be here. Um, and a big part of that show was um, a, a section that had to do with me and another indig Black Indigenous woman. Her name is Sadata Jackson, um, and she's of the Nipmuc tribe. And it was really powerful for me um, to be able to come together and collaborate with her in that way, having you know my heritage and my lineage of the Massachusetts people and her heritage being with the Nipmuc tribe and then having, you know, those overlaps that existed for thousands of years, being able to have us represent, you know, our version of that on, this, on the lands of the Massachusetts within this very white uh, colonial institution was like blowing my mind. So um, I'm gonna show you a few um, pictures. The slideshow is like three minutes, so I'm just gonna, I know that there's only two of us, so I am, uh, hold on, I think I have to share my screen. I'm already not doing it right. Screen and share and, okay. I hope everybody can see it. Um, so this piece was actually made by, um, oops, sorry. This piece was made by an architecture, um, I don't know the exact year, but he talks about uh, a city is not an accident and that it's made of vision and coherent planning. And um, in the beginning stages of building this show, I really was uh, struck by all of these like images and these things that are happening right in front of my face with these monuments and with people laying claim to the lands that do not belong to them. Um, feeling the tension that I feel every time I go outside and you're kind of walking around in this like, I don't know, matrix type of zone where you know that you have your ancestors here and that there are certain um, practices and cultural ways of being that are that have been either permanently erased in some cases or partially erased and 
having to be able to also confront as I walk through the city, not only knowing that this is my reality, but now I'm going to walk through the city and be reminded on every block and corner practically uh, in the greater Boston, you know, area that, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, a, I know that I'm not a guest here, but it just lets you know that uh, eyes are watching and that this space is not really a space that's for you. Um, and I experienced that as an indigenous person and as a black person, you know, there's a lot of racism that exists um, in this city. Uh, these posters that you're seeing are actually, I'll just pause for a second. These posters that you're seeing here are information that we've given. So whenever I do any of my performances, there's always an educational component. And so there were two call to actions for this show. And then also information that people could take about the issues that were being addressed um, thematically in the in the show, the entire uh, cast was um, Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Um, these are just some images from the show. We also were referencing the missing and murdered Indigenous women, two girls and spirits, uh, and two spirits rather. Uh, this is Sadata and I. Um, I love. I actually really love this. Oh, let me just go back for a second. I really love this that moment of us just kind of holding space and laying claim and and really being sort of, you know, the matriarchs of standing in our, in our greatness um, together in this space. It was really a powerful thing. Um, so these are some more images. This is an image of me um, on our tribal lands. This is my sister. Uh, so I'm really just giving you a little background um, so you can get to know me. I'm a very visual person. I'm much more uh, articulate through images and movement than um, with vocals. Actually, this picture, Kristen, is from uh, the paddle. So this is also like um, just a beautiful moment. That We've been fighting these in And then this, I'm just going to play this last bit with the sound. Um, and this is an excerpt of the section of Hot Water Race Fist that talks about uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline. Justice is all of our lives. In April, they started a camp here just south of the pipeline on the land of LaDonna Brave Bull Allard. I can't allow a pipeline next to my son's grave. Her father and son are buried just on the hill here. Hello. Howdy. We needed a presence. We started off with three people that first day, and then we kind of expanded to 15 people to 20 people from the middle of April until July. It was in July that the Army Corps approved the first major permit for Dakota Access. An easement to drill under the Missouri River was still pending. That's when the tribe took the Army Corps to federal court. Then I got the notice that Dakota Access was going to start working and for. All right. I'm going to do a stop share. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me and my work um, to kind of give you an intro to like how my brain is operating and part of the piece of a perspective of mine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Just absolutely beautiful work. So much of what you have said and presented about in the work that you do resonates with me. And um, I'm just grateful for you for the work that you're doing. Um, and it was also so wonderful to see Sadata in there. Uh, she's a dear friend of mine as well. <laughs> and um, it's just great that she, her presence is, is here with us, even though she's not physically here with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, now I, I would like to turn it over to Kristen. Um, Kristen, could, could you please briefly tell us about yourself and uh, where you're from um, and share with us what you do? Hello, good evening, everyone. This is a first for me to speak on a panel from my car. <laughs> Um, but I uh, am calling from a small little peninsula off of Boston Hull, Massachusetts Territory. And um, some of you may know it as Nantasket Beach. And um, just a little bit of wind gives us power outages often. So I am down the road in Hingham, um, phoning in from my car. So um, thank you everybody for understanding. This is just a really important conversation um, that I want to contribute to. Um, again, my name is Kristen. I am Natick Nipmuc, um, freshwater people. 
Uh, my ancestors are the Skeens and Thomas clan of the Natick Nipmuc people. Uh, we are the original proprietors of Natick. Um, so the first peoples of that region, even though we know through the, um, the process of missionary work that Natick became a space of refuge for other tribal folks from the region. Um, I am the daughter of a traditional leader, Marianne Hendricks, who's now with the ancestors. And I am a mom of two young girls. Uh, I want to thank you, Erin, for the invitation, Jenny, for being alongside me in this, and um, I'm very fortunate to have met you at the paddle. Um, looking forward to continue to build together. I want to thank everybody that is listening in um, for this important conversation to be open to these perspectives that we're sharing. And I'm grateful for the city of Boston for creating the space for, um, you know, that became the vehicle for this moment that we're in to be able to share these important aspects of history. I think it's really important for me to emphasize um, that it's very difficult to be in these spaces um, speaking on platforms because really this work that I do and who I am is really part of a long trajectory of many people and beings that I'm familiar with and that I don't know, um, beings that we can see and that we can't see. And uh, this moment in time and in, in, in our lifetime is really just um, a responsibility for the people who are living here to understand really where they came from and uh, to continue the work and the vision and the dreams of our ancestors and a big part of that is just to continue as much as possible the struggle of fighting colonialism and speaking up and so as difficult and challenging as these conversations can be and as awkward and uncomfortable I feel with any sort of spotlight on myself um, you know I got to give credit that there's been a lot of work done and a lot of struggle and there's important messages to share so I'm just really grateful for that grateful to creator for all the beauty in our life i um, grateful to my ancestors for never giving up, and I see that as a privilege as much as their struggle. I know that there is a privilege in me understanding the landscape and being born of it and connecting to it in a very different way that many folks can't. And so with that said, also want to give um, honor and recognition to uh, descendants of diaspora, to displaced people, to our indigenous people from the global south that are continuing to be exiled from their motherland, from their homeland, because our lands have everything to do with our identity today. Um, and these folks very much make up the territory that we understand now as Massachusetts. It is Turtle Island, um, it's colonized space. And it is alive with um, that matrix, that complexity of people from all over the globe that have been robbed of truth um, and, and robbed of the beauty of knowing the landscape and the way that um, our ancestors made sure we understood our place within that. Uh, the work I do is all about that. And so, um, in many ways, I see myself as an artist and a creator, not necessarily in the sense that we would define art, but my organizing work, I believe, is a craft. Um, the way that I'm building relations among different tribal communities that I've been doing for over um, close to 15 to 20 years. Um, I'm a writer, most often grant writing to try to, you know, by default, to try to get resources for our people, a youth worker. Um, and you know, officially my title right now, uh, as Erin mentioned, is Global Movements Program Manager and also co-founder of Eastern Woods Rematriation. But much of my work is just about um, dismantling patriarchy and capitalism and, um, and rematriating and honoring matriarchy. So when I say matriarchy, I think it's really important to understand this is not in direct contradiction to patriarchy that um, that matriarchy is really about uh, the power that is within all of us, creation, all our uh, kin and relatives, even in non-human form, that we're all part of a very intricate network of relationships that um, sustain each other. 
So matriarchy is really about um, our power from within and not a hierarchy or power over. And so when I say dismantling patriarchy, I am not saying that we want to bring in um, feminism to have control over other people. That's actually extremely contradictory to our indigenous values and our ways. Um, it's about equalizing and redistributing power. And, um, and that's why I'm here today. And that's the nature of the work that I do. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, thanks for joining us, even though your power has gone out and for taking the time and effort to, to drive to a place where you could get service. Um, it really means a lot for you to be here. Um, I'm so grateful that you can be here to share your perspectives uh, on the work that you're doing to fight colonialism. Um, and, I, and I resonated with what you said about um, being an artist. I think that in the Western sense of the word, um, art is a very strict definition, but in, uh, at least in my own indigenous background of Dakota uh, um artists are many things, culture bearers, they, and art encompasses so many things. Um, so thank you for uh, mentioning that. Um, now I would like to open it up for a discussion um, on this topic that we have all come here today to discuss. Um, and so I, I think what I will do is, um, Jenny, ask you to, to um, maybe speak first to this issue, to this question. Um, how do you see monuments contributing to the public health emergency of racism in your communities? And what is some of the work that you have done or are doing uh, to combat that? Thank you for that question. Um, Kristen, that was beautiful. And again, now I feel like now everybody can understand what I meant when I said it was an honor to be able to be on this panel with you. Um, you know, all of the work that you're doing is what we all I think should be striving towards, at least in my opinion. Um, but for the, to the question, the discussion question um, and talking about uh, how these monuments just continue to perpetuate uh, racist ideas and uh, ways, it's, it's very systemic. Um, and I'm gonna talk uh, from a couple of perspectives. One of the perspectives, me just being the black indigenous girl that I am from these lands. Um, and as I've come, when I was much younger, I didn't, I wasn't as involved in native affairs. Um, I think that again, going back to, um, my duality that I have, you know, we, we were raised very much culturally black. Um, and for that, I think that I, I experienced a lot of race, racism, racial, uh, systemic racism, and a lot of oppression as a child based on that, um, that when I became older and now have, um, you know, we understand more about our own ancestors and our history and and the responsibility that I have um, as a descendant of these lands. Um, as I come into more of my native heritage and understanding those cultures, it becomes more and more alarming to me as I walk through the city, how much, um, how much it feels like a prison to me. It feels like no matter where you turn, you're constantly being reminded that uh, there's something bigger on top of you. I mean, like these monuments are huge. I recently, just the other day, was walking um, past, we actually had uh, the panelist that was on here in the first lab, I think, Lily um, had did a Red Dress Lodge installation on the Boston Commons. And so on Sunday, um, it was the deinstallation. And so a lot of uh, Native people were there as part of, you know, holding space. There was a um, a ceremony or a ritual that was uh, also taking place there. So it really was quite um, an empowering moment for me um, to be able to be a part of that and to feel like where you're at is you and you are it and had my feet on the ground and um, just being in that space. So we leave that area and you walk across through the Boston Commons flowers or whatever and you get to the other side and there's this like long strip where you can either choose to walk in the middle or you can walk you know on the sidewalks near the brownstones well i chose to walk in the middle and 
all the way down the walkway was nothing but monuments honoring these colonizers um and you know they're towering over you and the letters you know just even seeing the the letters being kind of carved into the stone it's like even that action understanding what that action in is is, is very powerful to me that i i feel you know you feel sort of attacked all the time um by having to endure that and then also to be erased simultaneously so i think that not you know we learn about through our education system all of these um settler colonial um people that have come here um and we honor we're taught to give honor to them and you know christopher columbus how he discovered america and like the whole entire narrative is like just so utterly problematic and erases all of us and then somebody like me that's coming through that system learning those things as like and i'm like well that doesn't make sense because i'm an i'm a native person and so why are we why are we making it that um we don't exist anymore or that we all have died off or that we all were killed or we moved away like that's just not true um and i think that you know the racial injustice that we experience based on that the systemic oppression that we experience based on that by not being able to have the, the types of resources that we need um constantly having to advocate for ourselves or try to prove or in some ways it feels like begging begging for the things that belong to you is just you know i think um utterly difficult to bear as any type of human being and i think that that feeds into the mental um, and emotional harm that is done to indigenous people right here in the Commonwealth. Um, and even to have the mayor, you know, declare that we're now, you know, due to COVID that now all of a sudden we see how, you know, racism is a problem. And it's like, well, wait a minute, racism was a problem before it was a problem for white people. Before COVID came and now, you know, it's impacting this capitalist system, it's impacting colonial ideas, it's really breaking down a lot of things. And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of uh, loss that's happening. I mean, I even lost my grandmother during this. So like, it's not only about, you know, the system breaking down, but like people are, are also breaking down. And now it's only at that point that you declare that there's some kind of racial emergency and that it's a disease or whatever it is that he called it. Um, I appreciate the other side of me also because there's like all this duality you know the other side of me does appreciate that like it's being said but if we look at the container that it's being said in we're just continuing to perpetuate those colonial ideas and those colonial philosophies even on the ways that we are currently trying to make strides towards change and, and equity and all of this all of this rhetoric that they it out it's like your actions are not matching up with what you're saying and that makes it i think really um challenging i worked for 15 years at a mental institution um for mental health um and you know it's really such a tragedy to to see the way that the system is set up um and how disenfranchising it is for people that are struggling whether from whatever walk of life that they are but i mean I think that that the entirety of the system is not designed in any type of way that um, is resourceful for those that for all of us like in an, in an equitable way um, and I think that experiencing 15 years of watching people struggle and watching them cycle through this system and then all of us as a society becoming desensitized I mean I think that that's also um, unfortunately a uh, side effect of racism um is that we become desensitized and that desensitization kind of makes us like zombies and it becomes this like perpetual um cycle of dis-ease i know we say disease but it's really a state of dis-ease that we're in um and also i think um you know just being able to i, I know that, that there are ideas like well, what are your ideas of going forward and like making the change i mean making the change knocking down <laughs> everything that is uh, it, um, an ode or a pride towards settler colonialism take down all the monuments i personally i don't care what you do with them 
I understand that some perspectives, and I, I appreciate everybody's perspective, um, you know, that some people feel like, oh, they should be like sort of put away or whatever. No, I, for me, that's just not where my spirit is. So I say get rid of all of them. And then you talk to the people that live here that are of these lands and you return to them their space for what they feel it need, needs to happen in order to regenerate and heal the earth. And through that, I also think that the city of Boston should be paying for that because you're here on our lands. And so I think my solution is get rid of them all, do what you will, and then bring in native people of these lands and have discussions with us about what we need and then funding that. Um, and not through a crazy grant process that you have to, you know, prove yourself again. I think that that also needs to like end as well. Um, so I think that I'll leave it at that for now. That was a lot. I get very passionate, so apologies, but um, thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, I really appreciate your words and um, the way that you have expressed them today. I, I think when you said begging for the things that belong to you, you know, that just keeps sort of bouncing in my head now as a um, really, you know, being dispossessed of everything and then having to, um, you know, walk down the streets and see these monuments that are basically symbolize that, symbolize that power dynamic um, is, is just awful. Um, I also wanted to express to you uh, condol my condolences on the loss of your family member. Um, and um, thank you uh, so much for your response. Thank you. So, um, Kristen, I would like to also hear from you about what how you see these monuments contributing to the public health emergency of racism and, and you know, how they're affecting people's lives in, in real time and um, what the work you're doing is to draw attention or to, to combat these issues. Thank you. Thanks, Jenny, for sharing everything and my condolences as well. Um, uh, yeah, you know, that resonated with me as well, the feeling of of begging and always try to um, always trying to insert um, to walking spaces and feeling um, that constant reminder. I feel like that is every day. And I remember once uh, <laughs> I remember once breaking down and crying to a mentor of mine, my cousin, our tribal historian, our genealogist, has who has done so much to um, to guide us in our process of understanding you know, who we are and where we come from. Um, you know, this work gets tiring. Uh, I think we all understand that, so I don't need to go into those details. It's not just for Indigenous folks, it's for all oppressed folks that are constantly having to, um, to claim our humanity and to protect it in a world that, a system, it's not a world, because this is our world, <laughs> a system that was designed to um, to kill us, to erase us, to make us something other than who we are. And um, it's a deep sadness that I carry every day. And it definitely, uh, you know, impacts um, a lot. It impacts the, the time loss with my children, always constantly having to show up in spaces to make sure that my ancestors are honored. And, um, and so in answer to your question, I think sometimes the monuments, I really sometimes don't pay attention. I mean, you know what I pay attention to more is like the naming of a state park after Miles Standish, the naming of a town after Winthrop. Um, you know, the, the street name called Indian Head Road um, are street names that are named after traditional leaders or resources that um, have you know, that are highly developed and that are named after the resources that were destroyed in the process of settler colonialism, right? I mean, these contradictions and um, yeah, that, that deep longing of this can't be real. And, and I remember one time I got, you know, back to the point of my story, I got tired and frustrated and I was um, wanting to give up. And my cousin just said, like, you don't, you don't, you can't, you don't have the chance. And, 
you know, our ancestors were facing much worse. And um, I share that a lot with other people who share similar feelings of being tired or exhausted and not wanting to continue to do this and wanting to just invert and protect our space. And so I think that's most important to recognize when we're talking about monuments, change, representation, where are the indigenous people? Um, many of us are tending to historical trauma. Many of us are just trying to survive. Many of us are trying to hold down multiple jobs, are living in poverty, are dealing with um, abuse, um, violence, addictions. Um, and for those of us who aren't dealing with that, we have kin and relatives who are. And so we take on that pain. And so oftentimes it's very difficult for us to always be active in spaces that we know we're gonna face harm. Why would we wanna do that? And the monuments to me, the question of the monuments, while it is a great step, I'm, I'm saying yes, championing the decolonizing of the monuments. I just wanna also lift up that I'm not okay with a Band-Aid to cover up the deep, deep uh, pain and trauma that we face and see in our face every single day, just trying to be who we are, to access our lands, to know our knowledge in medicines, um, to be able to fish <laughs> without some sort of ID or regulation, um, to be able to teach our children the ways that our ancestors taught us in a system that doesn't tell them they have to be a certain way, but in a system that recognizes their gifts and contributions to the world and cultivates that. Um, these are major things that need change if we are ever going to truly overcome a system of um, colonialism or a sister, system of racism. Um, yeah, I want to hold. Okay, let's think about this concept of art and creation and what is important to honor or to memorialize. And I'm going to turn back to that comment you made at the very beginning, Erin, of the, the, the issues of, um, I mean, that was like music to my ears to hear you saying um, toxic individualism, right? I feel like in my movement spaces, that's the only place I'm really hearing that word. Um, but uh, we are a people of collectivity, of collectivism. <laughs> um, and so the, even the idea of memorializing an individual is very uh, uncomfortable and um, and the idea of memorializing men in the way that they continue to be memorialized um, speaks to the complete misunderstanding of where of where these co um, colonizers settled right it's not inherent to this land. So I often remind folks, if we think about the time that United States has actually been in existence is really like a glimpse in time compared to what science and what our ancestors know of how long we've actually been living in this area. And so throughout those thousands of years of living, we, like I said, we are part of this longer trajectory of, um, of manifestation, of the visions, of our creation stories. So oftentimes you'll hear indigenous peoples refer back to their creation stories and that's because the rules and the understanding of who we are and what we're here to do are codified in that. And our artistry is an extension of that. Embedded in our art is our ability to manifest and create what we know is beautiful, what we know is sacred, what we know is going to teach our children about who we are. And so the idea of taking something and making it so concrete um, to recognize just one individual, individual doesn't make sense. Um, and we can look at, uh, well, there's lots of historical documents and records we could look at, but if we really look at what has been found in some of our grave sites that settlers have um, disturbed, that many museums continue to um, hold these sacred items, uh, things, you know, myself as a wampum maker, I know how long it takes to make a bead, just one bead. And so if we think about the um, hundreds and thousands of beads that have come from the quahog shell, a food that we, uh, a, a material that we 
honored as food first, a gift from creator. If we think about the amount of time that it took to craft these things and the idea that our ancestors did not think it was important to have them in a shelf, but in the ground, in the earth, buried with our loved ones, I think that speaks to our understanding of memorializing, of honoring, of um, cementing what is sacred. And the other aspect I wanted to bring up is, is, is this understanding of, of, of the toxic ma masculinity that you talked about, right? And so if we're just going to create new monuments of, of male leaders, um, then we're actually just still cycling that same mentality, right? Because one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest impacts as soon as the settlers arrived and the colonists arrived is a misunderstanding of gender. So circling back to what Jenny was saying earlier, right? This idea that there is a binary, that there's only male and there's only female and the males have one role and the females have another um, is a colonial construct. It's, um, it's a lie. And so we're going to have to start there with understanding uh, Boston as a feminine, uh, feminist space. Um, not feminist maybe in the understanding of uh, uh, people would define feminism, um, or maybe we just say a matriarchal space, right? It is a space that um, we understand the power of regeneration and rebirth and change and process and cycle and that nothing is permanent, right? <laughs> So I'm going to draw a parallel to, um, to how we've actually memorialized um, a really tragic time. Um, the removal of my ancestors from Natick Mass, the forceful removal and chains and shackles in the middle of the night in October of 1675, the Mass Bay Colony um, had a kind of hyper uh, fear of any Native person. Um, even the friendly Christian Indians of, um, speaking of my ancestors and of Jenny's ancestors, who cooperated as a strategy of survival and, um, and decided to cooperate and be part of these praying towns. During this wartime, there was so much fear that um, we were actually the most vulnerable and um, mostly women, children, and elders were forcefully removed. Um, and at that time of year would have been when we were trying to make sure our food was um, being processed or prepared for storage. Um, we probably have just left our planting fields um, and we were taken to Deer Island in Boston, which was not connected to the mainland at the time and left there in a concentration camp through the winter of 1675 where most of my ancestors perished. Um, this is not something folks in Boston are very familiar with, but for close to 20 years, um, my ancestors, our previous generation, so much credit to the folks who have championed that commemoration to make sure that we are a living memorial of the events that took place um, in our territory. And so we go to Deer Island and, um, and paddle a very arduous and difficult 17 mile journey across Boston Harbor up Charles River and because of um, because it's not navigable all the way back to Natick uh, many folks walk or run the remaining distance to bring our ancestors home um, that to me is commemoration that to me is memorializing that to me is seeing ourselves as something greater than just one moment in time because when we're on that river most folks even if they're not from this region we have many allies that paddle with us share stories about being in multiple time zones um, uh, spaces and time that their past that their present that their future all kind of merge into one and we always give ourselves over to the land we realize in that process how much the land holds us teaches us and um, and that when we do that journey we're in honor of it and so if you ask me I think uh, spending tons of time on a mm, discussion about monuments is is okay but it's also putting a band-aid on these larger um systemic issues and if i could just very quickly 
answer respond to the idea of racism now being declared a public health emergency. Um, I just want to lift up how racialized as a people we are. And I want to, for the record here, make sure that we are centering our dark skinned and black indigenous peoples as um, not a binary. It's not about being indigenous or being black. Our black indigenous folks are both. They are from this area of the land. <laughs> They are part of the trajectory. They are part of the manifestation of the vision of our ancestors. Our kinship with black freed slaves and slaves of the early 1600s and 1700s was a strategy um, and human responsibility of, of co-creating. Um, and myself as an Afro-descending white indigenous woman, uh, I am mixed ancestry um, from my father's side with Europe and also my Nipmuc black uh, Irish mother um, speaks to also a story of developing kinship with um, marginalized and oppressed people. And so um, if we look back at the records, we can see how racialized as a people we were, that some of our, um, our, our, uh, our records, our, our birth records, our marriage records are actually inconsistent sometimes with either naming us as mulattoes, as Negroes, um, or as white, and we face in this area of the country a lot of stigma with the rest of Indian country, and in thinking that because we are mixed race people, somehow that minimizes our indig indigeneity, um, or that we are diluted. And so uh, as much as I appreciate the mayor in raising awareness of the racism as a public health issue, I think it's really important that we all do um, a lot of work in figuring out where that really originated and that that statement is a, is a bit long overdue. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for your powerful words. Um, and everything. I mean, you covered so many, so many key topics, so many important things that people need to hear. So thank you so much. Um, particularly with regard to the struggles that we face, um, that Indigenous people here face in, in public space and how that's related to this constant trauma. Um, and I think I totally agree with you. It's the monuments are the sort of the lightning rod for the issues that are beneath, beneath uh, them in their shadow. And that's the harder work right there is, um, you know, addressing these systems that oppress us. This, we need a cultural shift. Um, and I also just wanted to acknowledge um, and thank you, uh, acknowledge your ancestors and thank them um, as well, because I was able to participate um, in the commemorative canoe paddle um, this past year, and it was a deeply personal experience um, that I'm kind of still unpacking quite a bit of, because at that time I felt uh, my own ancestors were joining along. Um, in uh, we had we were all our people were also placed in a concentration camp on an island. Um, in at the confluence of the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers, and many, many people there died. So, um, you know, just wanting to kind of point back to this area um, as a as an epicenter of, of colonization for the rest of the country as well, and the connections that you spoke to, Kristen, uh, between all of our people and all, you know, people who come here, other indigenous people who come here from all over the world because colonization has impacted them. Um, so I think for this final question, I, I'll just open it up to, to both of you um, and whoever would like to respond can do so. Um, and really it's about a vision, you know, what, it, what is your vision for what we can do collectively to address these issues um, in our lands, in our, in, within our public art, in our symbols, in our monuments, in our place names, and then beyond that. I think that I'll start because um, I feel I'm feeling moved to bring in my cousin Jeannie again. Um, this particular question, this is something that um, she has been fighting for and has been a part of 
um, what our tribe has been working towards. But I think that one of the ways um, that we can envision a, a different future is definitely by centering indigeneity within the educational system. Um, I think that a lot of the strategies that have been used in order to colonize not only us but to all nations that are colonized on the on the planet you know it, it has been um this proven methodology of using teachings or education as a form of control um and i feel like as me my myself i i am a manifestation of that i fight that in my own mind every day um you know, being a part of this system and then also um, understanding that there's a whole other narrative that exists that never gets any um, attention or centering as it should. And um, I think that that is one of the things that is probably most frightening to settler colonialism and to capitalism um, and to all of the isms that are uh, designed to create destruction and divisiveness. Um, that, that uh, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. The education, uh, that that methodology of using teaching, I think that that's one of the things that is, um, makes fear, creates fear within these other systems that we're living in, because if we're able to educate ourselves, if we're educate, able to educate others about our heritages and our cultural ways and the ways of living and living with the land here, on these lands, I think that that will completely disrupt um, everything that we are currently living in. And I think that that is definitely a huge part of the vision of what I see um, going forward. And again, calling in, you know, my cousin and my, my uh, great uncle, and also myself as an educator. I also, out of all the places that, that you had said earlier that I teach, um, that's also part of my teaching pedagogy is that I'm constantly creating the questions in real time as I'm giving the information that I know that I'm, I'm supposed to be giving, and that is true and accurate, we have to also question, but how does colonialism impact this? This, this outcome didn't just come out of nowhere. And so let's also talk about what these outcomes are. Let's, let's pose those questions. Um, some of the questions like who, are, who how is colonization shaped what we're learning? Who are the gatekeepers? Why are we not centering Native people within the things that we're learning, whether they be in primary school, secondary education, or at the collegiate level? Um, and so I'm constantly trying to do my little small part in the world, in the space that I'm sort of existing in to impact those people that I have contact with on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, to start them to, to start to get them to think about other ways to consider the space that they're in. Um, and I think that, you know, with enough of that, of, of me doing that part of things, I think that enough of, of that in collaboration and in concert with all of the indigenous efforts that are being made, that, that whole entire vision of, you know, dismantling and decolonizing will be uh, attained and also to allow us to live in an indigenized state, state, which will improve the environment, improve mental health, improve emotional health. Like the world um, is designed not to function the way that it's functioning now. So I definitely think that education is um, a big tool and an important tool in our struggle. Do you want me to respond? Can, okay, you can hear me okay? All right, great. Um, well, I feel like Jenny answered everything. <laughs> so, no, um, but knowing myself, I'm sure there's much more I could say. Um, yeah, I, um, I guess I would encourage in this process of really, if we're really ready to take this hard look at um, how we decolonize and how we address racism, um, you know, I guess I got to be honest that sometimes I feel like not in this lifetime um, will we be there, uh, but also just to champion that we are, we are it for whatever reason, like we are the ones going through COVID right now. We are the ones 
um, that are having to respond to white guilt. <laughs> we are the ones that are having to respond to this, this, this seed of awakening. Um, and yet I don't want to get my hopes up and I'll tell a short story of how I got my hopes up and, uh, with some folks, some well-meaning folks that I think were really trying to address this, this, this question in a school system, a school system of my ancestral territory, um, to go back to my high school after I'm not, I don't even know how long, a very long time to go back to my high school, uh, and speak with administrators who were ready to, um, integrate indigenous worldviews and have discussions about genocide and colonialism and ge gender justice and, and migrant justice and all of these things was uh, a really amazing, powerful uh, moment of hope in my life. And um, what we did was we did our best, um, you know, through the process, I had a, a, a feeling that what some were in the process were really looking for was more more performative um was for you know a uh, kind of this feel good moment of indigenous people coming to the school and teaching the youth about indigenous history um, perhaps singing some songs demonstrating some of the traditional regalia um, and connecting it with their curriculum and um and through that process, I had to keep pushing back, uh, especially when one person said, like, um, can we do something a little bit more uplifting? Um, I had to push back and, and share that um, this isn't a very comfortable and painless process. Um, and our lived reality is not painless, even though many of us can do a good job of masking that. And of course, if you're going to ask Native folks to come and perform and share their culture, we have a pride in that. Um, and many artists and performers and storytellers do survive on gig economy because we do live in this warped reality of capitalism and need to earn paychecks to live. Um, so, you know, I had to push back, but that, that was not what they were going to get from me. I'm a youth worker and I'm an educator and I also understand grassroots methodologies. And so what we tried to do was bring in um, uh, popular education methodologies of really allowing the students to connect dots to some of the things we were sharing, including our creation story, which is pretty sacred. And I would not share with folks if I thought it was going to be... Um, you know, mocked or laughed at or considered irrelevant that when we are sharing this, we are sharing it because we have really important um, teachings that we're actually gifting to the folks who are listening, right? It's, it's a gift for us to share something that our ancestors cared for to make sure that thousands of years later, the people would still know. Um, and uh, the administrators, uh, didn't know what to do because we left so much open-ended. Um, we didn't perform, we didn't dress in our regalia, we talked about our creation stories and we talked about the land and we talked about the way we are rematriating our land by teaching our children where our harvest locations are, what the important medicines and foods to our people are, and um, in, in what our place in this network of relations is. And um, and when we opened it up for the, the youth to share what they think and help us in this process of, of looking back at history to find out where we are and if the United States is really in truth with, with itself of being land of the free, right? Um, there was so much concern that we didn't have object, clearly defined objectives, that we weren't prescribing everything for the youth and the students um, to be able to help them understand context, right? Um, there was no trust that through our process we were going to arrive um, in a place where the youth had uh, co-created their own learning process, which is very much a indigenous value, right? And so I share that story to say, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I had to make a decision to leave that partnership because it was clear that um, the folks weren't ready. And I also had to kind of swallow my pride that that could also mean other Native folks that are ready to just step in and perform and at the end of the day leave and say they created a feel-good experience, but that didn't necessarily engage the youth in co-creating justice. 
um, or equity. I had to walk away from that. Um, and so to me, and this just happened like a year ago, that shows me that we really do have a long way to go. And so I'm very hesitant to continue to deepen these conversations and share so much of what we know as truth, share so much of what's sacred to us, to a people, to a municipality, to a city, to a state, to a federal government that's not ready. So that's one thing um, to share is that really for radical change, are we ready for radical? Radical change starts with pedagogy and the way we teach our children and the way we help them co-create their own learning. Um, the other piece is that, um, and I'm completely losing my train of thought now. Um, yes, the other piece is that, uh, that, that, that concept of individualism, of toxic mas masculinity. Um, are we ready to, to, uh, to rematriate? Are we ready to uplift women, um, two spirit folks? Um, non-binary genders, trans folks. Are we ready to uplift them in the ways that our ancestors did in understanding the blessings that they had of uh, being medicine people, of being healers, of being the um, complete opposite of the constructs and the boundaries and, um, you know, uh, a good a sister of mine, uh, Olivia from the the Penobscot people, we say like our two spirit folks, our queer folks are the ones who are going to lead us out of this mess because they are the living reality of exactly what um, the opposite of colonialism is. And so are we ready to uplift our women? Um, because it's clear that for many years, our women were driving the economies, were driving um, the livelihoods of our people. And it was because of our connection to land. And so why do you think the first thing that the colonists did was completely undermine women's leadership and completely ignore it as irrelevant or ask us, you know, there's documentation in the, in the primary documents of claiming all we did was pound corn all day. Um, well, you know, I think COVID is going to reveal that the intellect and the hard work and the labor and the care and the knowledge and the connectivity of collectivism that uh, the women they ignored um, and just reduced as some man's wife. I think uh, COVID is going to reveal that um, that way of life is our way out. And is Boston ready to start thinking about collectivity, collectivism, common land? Um, uh, I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> um, and so I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news. I'm saying there is hope because things like COVID are going to force us to imagine a world completely different. I'm just very hesitant to continue sharing so much of what we know as sacred with people who, and municipal systems, systems and structures that aren't ready. Because we might have individuals who are ready, and then when they're faced with this larger system that people are uncomfortable, um, those people end up getting um, targeted and, um, and lose positions and lose jobs. And so there's, there's a lot we need to do beyond the monument um, change. Uh, it's a step, but I also think it's a Band-Aid. And um, really where we need to start is uplifting our women our uh, two-spirit folks, our, um, our queer folks, and in thinking of collectivity and education. Thank you so much, Kristen and Jenny, for, for your thoughts on this. And I agree. I think that our education system is one place where we are still facing so much misinformation and, and the mythology is so real in those, in those spaces. And it creates so much confusion um, and it continues to perpetuate this power imbalance. Um, one of the things that, that, you know, just hearing both of you talk about these issues here um, that I have been trying to sort of wrap my brain around is this and try to try to figure out, I guess, maybe how to undermine it is this um, concept of uh, cultural supremacy. And, you know, I think that's connected to this, it's connected to white supremacy, and it, but it's, it's also um, really this upholding of Western values as the only values that matter, or the only values that, um, you know, that are, that are 
they're superior to uh, everyone else in, in the world, including indigenous people, people of color, people who come from all over the world. I mean, there's hundreds of tribes here in the United States, within the borders of the United States alone, who all have their own individual cultures and ways. And yet we have this one culture that has been sort of like a monoculture put on top of us and said that this is the way. And yet we are facing climate change because of it. And we are facing the destruction of our planet uh, because of it, uh, because it's being compounded. And so I've been, I guess I've been trying to think, you know, as an artist here in Boston, as an indigenous person, I'm not from here and I always want to make sure that, you know, that that is known, that I um, give respect to the people whose land this is, because that's what we all need to be doing, who, all of us who are not from here. Um, how can we think of this cultural supremacy? What, is, what can we do to um, address that? I mean, it's becoming more and more clear with the pandemic and with these cultural emergencies that we're facing, that this, that Western culture, American culture is not supreme. As a matter of fact, it's it's actually deficient in, in many ways. Um, so I guess I just thought I'd throw that out there as sort of like a, a question for you both to see if you had any thoughts. I can go again, because I feel like we we this is what we've been discussing this whole time. I mean, if we're not, just like Kristen just um, finished kind of mentioning, is like if we're not ready to do that root work, then it doesn't really, you know, all the stuff that you would do on the top on the surface is like leaves on a tree, they just blow away, you know, and I think that, um, yeah, I just feel like there's like so much work that it that it's not things that can kind of be like romanticized. And that's where I struggle, because I'm a very concrete individual. And I'm like, well, if the problem, if the root problem is, you know, a, then why are we worrying about what's happening on LMNOP? Like, <laughs> what is that? If A is like where the problem is in that we all know it and see it. Um, so I, I would just lift up everything that we've been talking about already as starting points. Um, because without those things in place, I, I don't know. I don't, I think that we are not going to be able to come out from underneath, you know, this one culture's oppression. Yeah, I think a good place to start would be um, this concept of, of rematriation, right? This concept of matriarchy, of, um, of seeing the gifts in each other and, and who we are as human beings, of, um, of being from so many different places in um, extended families, um, starting there, I guess I'm getting to the root of, you know, why, why, why the individualism? Why are folks so uh, afraid of, of, of uplifting other cultures? And I'm in a lot of spaces where, where I am the representation of the indigenous voice in person, and I'm, and I'm building kin in relationship with other marginalized and oppressed people from all over the globe. And, um, you know, there's that concept of um, identity politics or, or, you know, oftentimes as oppressed people, we can feel like we have to talk about who's the most oppressed. And sometimes we get that confused with um, centering the most harm or silenced or marginalized. And how do we get to a place where we're not afraid of doing that? Um, one, you know? And I think it speaks to this idea of matriarchy, of, of owning our gifts and our power as human beings um, and realizing that we don't have power over other people. And um, the other is understanding ind indigeneity not as like a homogenous identity, right? So um, even myself as a Natick person, I am of the Nipmuc Nation, but my identity as a Natick person is very different than um, other tribal communities from this same nation. Um, Nipmuc people are different than Wampanoag people. Uh, Wampanoag people are different than Massachusetts people. And even in this small state, um, our histories and the impact of, um, of settler colonialism is very different. Um, being an indigenous person um, from Natick near Metro Boston, basically, uh, it's an urbanized space and um, 
and because of the impact and things that actually happened in Natick in terms of land loss or and being survivors of the internment camp um, and also being sur survivors of pandemics that that wiped out you know close to 90 percent of our people so I, I think we really need to just kind of sit with that for a second to think about the odds stacked against us for even me being able to be here and speak which is why um I take a lot of responsibility in it. Uh, I think we just have to remember that um, the system's defined to, to talk about our culture um, from a mainstream or even from tribal nations that might have, might be more organized or their, their, their space is intact. Um, their families maybe didn't move um, and they were able to sustain a closely knit um, geographic space of a tribal community is very different um, than at least my experience as a Natick person. Um, and so oftentimes one of the biggest struggles in just being seen in the Boston area or as a Natick person has to do with um, larger tribes or the federal recognition process or even the state recognition process of how outsiders and others are defining who we are and what rights we have at, um, uh, what, what political rights we have, which are essentially non-existent. If you're not state recognized and you're not federally recognized, where is your space at the decision-making table? Because you're just, you're gone. Yet, at the same time, I always say we're hell studied. We're in tons of research. We are in all of the primary documents. I can name my ancestors and find old petitions of their struggle, which is heartbreaking. Um, and so another place to start in terms of really understanding culture is looking at some of these primary documents, looking at the deeds, um, coming to conclusions and asking questions, which by the way is what we were trying to get the youth to do that scared the educators and the administrators so much. Um, so we've got to ask more questions. We've got to go back to those primary documents. We've got to go back to the deeds. Um, we have to go back to the artifacts and the remains that are being held in captivity with our state archives, um, with our museums. Um, and we have to liberate and free <laughs> all of this misinformation. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, clearly we know there's cultural supremacy happening um, at the same time as long as we can help it, we're gonna be here to keep reminding folks and it's exhausting, um, but we're not going anywhere. Thank you so much. Um, so we're getting close to, to time and I just thought if anyone has any last things that they'd like to say uh, before closing out, um, please, please feel free to do so. Um, oh, Jenny. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say thank you. Thank you for organizing, for curating. Thank you, um, you know, to the city of Boston for, you know, having this platform. I look forward to them doing a lot more in centering indigeneity and indigenous people and not only on a live stream, but actually in real time with real um, money and actions towards our liberation and the justice that we and our ancestors deserve that we've been fighting for that we shouldn't have to continue to beg for so um i am thankful you know for the space uh thank you Kristen, for being here i just love listening to you and i it's like i said it's truly an honor but again after hearing you speak tonight i'm just like i have a lot to process and i'm grateful for that because you know i've been looking for even for more things to process within this like quarantine and, and how we're how we're reimagining and how I'm choosing to refocus myself. Um, and so your words are really powerful for me tonight and I look forward to turning it back on later on and replaying it and, and letting it all um, sink in because you know everything that you said was really spot on. So thank you. And thank you for those that are helping out back in the background too. This was very nice. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. I guess I would just say the power in this moment of like, I think the three of us connected through Paddle because um, I met Jenny first um, at the Paddle. And so just want to credit, you know, our ancestors and, and, and our elders and um, the folks, 
you know, like myself, I'm constantly trying to teach my girls and, and letting my, my um, 11 year old know that she really has no choice. She will be paddling someday. And as we go to these different harvest locations, I told her, you know, your responsibility is not to keep this knowledge to yourself, but to make sure that as you get older, you're sharing this information in these spaces and, and everything that you're learning with other people, because there's no point otherwise. Um, and so just, you know, really excited that we all came together. And I, and I think that speaks to like the power of, of not necessarily like a monument, a statue in a defined, like, you know, solidified concrete. There, there's nothing, there's nothing like that in indigenous worldview, you know, nothing is static, nothing ever stays the same. And how beautiful is it that this kind of living commemoration of process of giving back of, of um, allowing what's around us to be bigger can lead to uh, relationships like this. And so I guess that would just be my closing remarks. You know, oftentimes people ask, well, well, what can we do? Or, or the issue is so big and I don't know where to start. And I, so, you know, I'm just hoping that people take home this, you know, these, that, that word of, of matriarchy, of rematriation, of, of equal power, of distribution, of, um, you know, of, of honoring life, of honoring change, of honoring rebirth. And, um, and then also um, the the concept of collectivity and being um, you know dismantling this kind of um, toxic individualism that we have in um, in uh, colonial America um, and understanding that we're all part of a larger system and so really making change begins with these relationships it begins with difficult conversations and so. I guess that would just be my closing remark of like doing our best to understand struggle that nothing's going to come easy and it's, and it's not always going to feel good and people are going to make mistakes and not do the right thing. Um, but we really don't have a choice to keep perpetuating these myths, right? We don't have a choice anymore. Um, you know, creation is proving us otherwise right now. And so just hopefully we're really paying attention to, to, to what's important. Right. And thank you so much, Aaron, for creating the space and the work you're doing. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you so much, Jenny. It's really been an honor to be in this space with both of you. And um, I have a lot to think about with everything that you shared. Um, I'm grateful for the work that you do and just want to send you lots of strength uh, to, for the tasks ahead. So thank you so much. Um, to, to our viewers, I um, also want to say thank you for joining us over these past three weeks and for all of the people who have come to speak about these issues. Um, thanks for helping to keep us raising these issues for the public and uh, for those decision makers who could make a real difference you know, towards rejecting white supremacy and cultural supremacy and, and colonial mythology in our city's uh, public spaces and, and everywhere. Um, also want to say a big thanks to the um, Boston Arts, uh, City of Boston Office of Arts and Culture and for all of the support there. Wopira uh, Tanka, thank you very much.